Well, it's good to be with you today and to have the opportunity to share with you from God's Word. You've got an outline there that's in the bulletin. If you'll uh, turn to the worship guide, you'll see that. If you're allowed to have a sharp instrument like a crayon or a pen or a pencil, um, then you can take one of those. If there's not one there, there may be one that queue in front of you. But you'll see on the theme of it, there's nobody but Jesus. So you'll see that our scripture verses are John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. I want to encourage you to follow along with me as we talk about Jesus. We've already sang about Jesus. We've heard about Jesus. And now we're going to share from God's Word about the Lord Jesus Christ. I also want to say some things about uh, your church and brag on you. First of all, to say thank you for your gifts to the Stone Mountain Baptist Association of Churches. And we are an association of churches. We could not do the work if we weren't joined together, working together to accomplish what one church could not do by itself. And God is doing a great work among the churches of the Stone Mountain Association. Your church leads the association in giving. So of those 100 churches, your church gives the most to our association of churches. I think a large credit of that is due to your missions team, your missions emphasis day that you have every year and you graciously invite us to be a part of that. And also it's due to the leadership of your pastor. You have, if not, the finest pastor that I know. And God is blessing the music. I'm glad you agree with me. And uh, I'm grateful for his friendship, for his leadership, and his passion and his heart for missions. He served on our administrative team as our moderator. And he's always been willing to serve, always takes my phone calls, and always takes my text and response. And I'm very grateful for Doug's um, support of our association of missions and our work that we're doing. Now, I also want to share with you some things about where that money goes to. Uh, you heard, if you were here for Sunday School Hours, Stone Mountain Missions, a new endeavor. We've been asked by Stone Mountain Park to be the sole provider of religious services to the entire park. That's the most visited park in the nation. Rick Kirkland is here with me, and he's doing that work with us. And there's great opportunities for you to be involved in that. We're also involved in a church planting school. This evening, I'll be teaching a church planting school online. There's uh, eight uh, there's eight students, excuse me, 14 students in the class. There's three of us teaching it. And there are four church planting teams. And they'll be going out to plant churches. That makes eight all total since fall and this, this semester that we had deployed into the mission field here locally to start new churches. You've also been very supportive of the work that we're doing through Bill Johnson, who spoke here before and reached the nation's church. Bill is teaching a Bible Training Center program. Bible Training Center is a program of training pastors and uh, those that are not, not only in our country, but internationals. He and Neil Hathaway teach a class to Gary, Mary, uh, together Mary Palms over here from Reach the Nation's Church and uh, one of their interns. And basically this past semester during the course, there's a young Afghan man who is a converted Muslim who just led a Sudanese Muslim to faith in Jesus Christ. Now here's the big deal. The Sudanese man, his dad is an Iman back in Sudan and has been an Iman. And so it rocks the world when we see Muslims come to know Christ as their Savior. So thank God for the work that Bill's doing and Neil is doing and those that are working and serving in, in that uh, regard. And also, while we're here sharing this morning, our disaster relief team, which is made up of volunteers from our churches, are down in Panama City for Beach Ridge. You might say, boy, that's a tough assignment compared to the weather here. But I assure you, they got up at four this morning, flipping pancakes and making uh, breakfast for the students that are down there on uh, spring break. They're spending their money on wine, women, and song. About two days into spring break, they're out of money. And those kids are hungry. And they're wanting something to eat. And so our Baptist Collegiate Ministries, which we have one of those in our association as well, Georgia State, Newton Campus, they take students down there. 
And so while they're down there and uh, cooking pancakes, the students from our Baptist Collegiate Ministries go out, gather up those lost students, bring them in for a free camp pancake breakfast, and every year over a hundred come to know Christ as a Savior. Some are reunited to their families because of that great work. So we thank God for the work that we're able to do together. I also want to introduce my parents. My mom doesn't always get to hear me preach, and I told her, I said, after baptism this morning, I'm going to be preaching down the street at Heritage Hills. And so she and my stepdad, Mary Judith and Jean Crawford, are here, which I'll just kind of wave so people know where you are. And uh, so I'm very grateful. The reason that's important to me is because my parents led me to faith in Jesus Christ. The grandson that I baptized this morning was led to faith by his older cousin who just turned 13, Saturday was a week ago, and witnessed to him. We were getting our haircuts, and we're on the way to a barber shop, and as we were going there, uh, I'd asked my oldest grandson, Ashton, I said, who's your one? Because our church has been asking everybody to pray about bringing someone to faith in Christ this year, discipling them, and being a part of the church. And Ashton said, well, Lance, my cousin, who's 10, is my one. And so we're on the way from uh, driving to the barber shop, and I'm driving along, and uh, Ashton turns to Lance, he says, Lance, when are you going to get saved? <laughs> and Lance said, I said, Ashton, Lance may not know what that means. And Ashton began to tell him the ABCs of salvation. And uh, Lance didn't get saved in our vehicle that day, but then on Sunday, my daughter took him last Sunday, to a class for parents to teach their children about baptism. And Lance went with her and he gave his life to Jesus Christ last Sunday, baptized him today. Amen. So I want to challenge you today as we talk about bringing them in. Who is your one that needs to know Jesus Christ as his Savior? Turn, look with me in the scripture. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Version. I want to read this text to you and then I want to refer to it often as we go along. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. And Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. And he found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, and he found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now, Philip was one was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asked him, Come and see, Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Before Peter called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi Nathaniel answered, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus responded to him, Do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You see greater things than this. Then he said, Truly I tell you, you will see heavens open and the angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. I believe the greatest thing that a person can do in this life is to bring somebody else to faith in Jesus Christ. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be asked all these theological questions, what your position was on uh, eschatology. We're not going to be asked what was your position on women in ministry, which some people like to argue, or some of the other issues that some people like to discuss as theological things. I think we're going to be asked, how many people did you bring with you? How many people did you invite and bring with you to heaven to be a disciple and a follower of my son, Jesus Christ? 
If that's true, then it may be stated that Andrew was one of the greatest disciples there was. He's only mentioned in the Bible and John's Gospel. And each time, you know what he's doing? He's bringing somebody to faith in Jesus Christ. First, he brought his brother to Jesus. We just read about that. Later on, he brings a little boy with a few loaves and a few fish to Jesus. And after Andrew met the, and again, he brings some Greeks in John chapter 12 to Jesus. And after Andrew met the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing he wanted to do was to introduce somebody else to Jesus. So my question to you is, is that what you want to do is to bring people to Jesus Christ? You see, God's army of soldiers need to get out of the barracks and out on the battlefield because the battlefield is outside the four walls of all of our churches. And you and I have an opportunity to share Christ with people that do not know Christ as their Savior. I said the other day when I was sharing one of our churches, we often say, you know, 80 to 85% of our community is without Christ. But let me kind of narrow that down for you. When you go to work tomorrow, 80 to 85% of the people you work with don't know Jesus. When you go to school tomorrow, 80 to 85% of the people in your classroom don't know Jesus. When you go to a restaurant for lunch this week, you know, in here today, so we assume most of those people are believers, but the reality of it is most of the people in that restaurant don't know Jesus. When you leave from here today, 80 to 85% of the cars you pass on the road have people that did not go to church this morning and don't know Jesus. Does that bother you? It bothers me. It concerns me that we live in a lost world and we need to be sharing Jesus Christ. So if that's true, that the reality is, is that we are the saints of God and we are His shoes, His feet to go out into this world and we're His hands and His head and His heart, then why aren't we seeing great numbers of people walking down this aisle coming to know Jesus as their Savior? Why is it that happening? Well, I think there's some answers in this passage of Scripture that I want to share with you today that will help us to reveal some things you and I need to be doing in order to bring people to Jesus Christ. So if you're following on the outline, the first blank there is, I want you to first see with me that these early disciples had a commitment to Jesus. They had a commitment to Jesus Christ. Again, the next day in John 1, 35 and 37, we find these words. John was standing with two of the disciples. He saw Jesus passing by and he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. Now those last three words are the key to everything. Bringing people to Jesus, first of all, is primarily a fact of you and I following Jesus to begin with. And from the very beginning, we find the disciples were, when they were with Jesus, they simply heard others say and heard Jesus say, follow me, and they followed after him. Bringing people to Jesus is simply an act of obedience. To follow somebody means that we follow them wherever they go, we do what they do, and we listen and we say what we hear them say. Did not Jesus himself say, I only speak what the Father told me to speak? I only say what the Father told me to say. I only did what the Father told me to do. So if you and I are followers of Jesus, should we not be sharing the good news about Jesus? Should we not be doing what Jesus would want us to do? And should we not be going to a lost world that needs to know the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, when he said, follow me, and he told disciples in Mark, and I'll make you fishers of men, they left everything they had and they began to follow Jesus. And so that means if you're not fishing, you're not following. Think about that. If you're not fishing for men, you're not following after the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not trying to minimize training. A lot of people use that as an excuse, Pastor, I believe, because they say, well, I don't know all the right verses. I don't know how to tell somebody about Jesus because I don't have these Roman road of salvation memorized or I haven't gone through uh, sharing faith without fear. You don't have to go to a course in order to share about Jesus. Sharing Jesus is your testimony. 
Now you give testimonies all the time. Let me give you an example. Anybody here drive a Ford like I do and aren't ashamed to admit it? Anybody drive? Raise your hand. It's okay to raise your hand at Baptist Church. You drive a Ford. Okay. I know it means found on the road dead, you know, but I drive one. I make good service out of Fords. How many folks are Chevrolet people? Raise your hand. Got any Chevrolet people in the room? Nobody's going to admit it. Two or three. Okay. How many folks drive a Honda or a Nissan? Yeah. All right. See, we got a bunch of hands going up. And you know, when somebody asks you, I'm going to go trade cars. And what kind of car would you suggest that I get? You know what you're going to tell them? I've had good service out of the Ford. I've had good service out of the Chevrolet. I had good service. I think you ought to drive a Honda or a Nissan. Right? What did you just do? You gave a testimony. And that car company didn't pay you a penny. Did they? No. But our rewards are in heaven. And the Bible says that we're blessed when we share our faith with other people. And we're not talking about Jesus. What's wrong with that picture? I want us to be challenged today that our hearts need to be fully committed that we're heart, our hearts are so full of Jesus that we can't help but share what Jesus has done for us. The other disciples had a commitment to Jesus and they also desired, the second blank on the outline there, is to have communion with Jesus. You see, commitment comes when you have communion, when you spend time with Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about an hour on Sunday morning or coming to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. I'm talking about opening up this book and reading it daily and letting it become a part of who you are. And it becomes what you live by. It's your instruction manual for the day. And you start to know what God's Word has to say for you. When Jesus turned and noticed them following Him, He asked them, what are you doing? And they said to Him, Rabbi, where are you staying? And come and you'll see, they replied. So they went and saw where He was staying and He stayed with them that day. After the disciples made a commitment, what did they want to do? They wanted to be with Jesus. They wanted to spend time with Jesus. And here's the situation. Fellowship always comes before fishing. Fellowship comes before fishing. That's the next slide. And worship always comes before witnessing. Now think about that for a minute. Fellowship comes before fishing. You can't tell somebody about whether, uh, how to fish unless you've been in You've been out there doing it and you had fellowship with God and worship comes before you witness. So when we leave here today with well, a worship experience that uh, our friend Scott led us in and these that helped him, we should be so full that we want to leave from here to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. Do you see the sign here? It says nobody but who? Jesus. Okay, some of you haven't seen it yet. Nobody but who? Jesus. Thank you. See, that's why preachers go so long, because we have to repeat ourselves. Nobody's listening to us. <laughs> so disciples are people who are committed to Jesus. They're people who have communion with Jesus. And also there are people who are willing to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in chapter 1, verse 40 and 41, what it has to say. Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He found his brother Simon and told him, we found the Messiah, and he brought his brother Simon to Jesus. Now they spent time with Jesus. These disciples were so full of Jesus, they had to go tell somebody else. And Andrew went and told his brother Simon Peter. Now I want you to notice how these disciples confessed Jesus as Lord. So next slide, and the blanks are on your outline. They were first of all seeking him. You see, our religion is not a come see religion. Ours is a go tell religion. I think what we've done is we've forgotten that the mission field's out there and we can think that the mission field is here. That our mission's getting everybody to church. No, that's not the mission. The mission is not here. The mission is out there. And so I have a go tell salvation. Who did these disciples seek? Andrew sought after his family member. And then the, uh, Philip sought after his friend. 
And so they were out there seeking people that did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This past week I was down in Orlando, Florida at the largest church planting conference in the world. Church planters from 50, all 50 states and 20 countries from around the world were gathered there. And I took some Lyft drivers. I'm first time to do that a lot when I was out of town. I did some Lyft drivers. And I had the opportunity to share with the Lyft drivers about Jesus because I figured some of those Lyft drivers, Pastor Doug, aren't Christians. And they weren't. I had the opportunity to share with people on the airplane next to me who weren't Christians as well. And some of them that were. But I want to take advantage of every opportunity that the Lord gives me. But we have to go and tell. And then I want you to notice something else that they were doing. They were not only seeking and before I get to them, let me just think, think with me just a minute. If you had a family member, one of your children, male or female, was lost, would you be sitting around the house, propped up in your reclining chair, saying, well, they know where the house is. And you're drinking a Coca-Cola and you're looking at the television set and you say, well, maybe they'll be home before dark. They know where we live. They got a nice room back there we provided for them. And they got everything that you can imagine that they need. And so we don't have to worry about them. They're going to be fine. No, you wouldn't do that, would you? You'd be out seeking for them. You'd call the police. You'd try to find out some clues as to where they were last. And you'd be spending your entire time finding that lost child, would you not? Amen. And the reality of it is there are lost children of God all out here around us that need to become children of God. Lost people that don't know Him and nobody's out looking for them. Nobody's looking for them. We pass them by every day. And so I want to tell you that that should be the attitude that we have of seeking after lost people. Now notice these disciples saw. Andrew saw his family. Philip saw his friend. And I want you to realize they were also not just seeking, they were also speaking. See, you can't just be a silent Christian and think that just because of my actions and the way that I carry myself, that somebody's going to know that I'm a believer. No, they will not. Not unless you speak with your lips. They didn't just witness with their lives in the New Testament. They witnessed with their lips. They used their voice to share Christ with others. And notice what happens where there's commitment to Jesus, there's communion with Jesus, where there's confession of Jesus, there will also be some conversions that are taking place. Now notice carefully, it's Jesus who does the conversion, not the soul winner. I've had people to tell me, well, I go to Brother Cheek's church, or I go to Brother Ferguson's church, or, you know, Brother Cheek saved me. I haven't saved anybody. Your pastor hasn't saved anybody. Your staff hasn't saved anybody. Jesus is the one that does the saving. God does that through His power. But He gives us the opportunity to be His vessels to get to share Christ. Your pastor said a moment ago, I saw him kneeling with a young girl just earlier, right before the service, sharing Christ. We have that opportunity to share Christ with people that we come in contact with. And a chain reaction occurs when we do that. In the scripture here, five people follow Jesus, one right after another, and notice their conversions and how they were accomplished. First of all, there was a personal presentation. Before people are saved, there's got to be a personal presentation of the gospel. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Jesus said, follow up me. Andrew and Philip both said, we found Jesus. Come and see him. Everybody was personally presenting the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the thing that incites me is to notice that everybody was involved. Everybody was involved. Jesus was not winning everybody. Jesus won Philip and he did not win Nathaniel, but he did not win Nathaniel and he did not win Peter. Everybody was involved. And that's what it's going to take to reach our community and reach around the world. For you and I to get up off our blessed assurance <laughs> and win somebody for Jesus. What would happen to Heritage Hills if 
half of you said, I'm going to win one person to Christ this year. One person. It revolutionized the church. It revolutionized your life because when you leave one, you say, I got to go get one more. I know one other person. I asked Ashley this morning, who's your one? He said, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about a young boy that's in my Christian Learning Center class with me. Who's your one? And then there was a positive declaration. Both Philip and Andrew declared, we found Jesus, we found the Messiah. So let me ask you, do you personally know Jesus Christ? Because see, you can't share about something you don't know. You go talking about cars, you've got to know about cars to share about them. You go talking about something of interest to you, you've got to know a little bit about it to have a conversation about it. If you don't know Jesus, you can't have a conversation with him with somebody else. Do you really know him? Do you really know him? Or do you know about him? Because none of us are going to get to heaven on mama or grandma's coattails. None of us are going to get to heaven because we came to church and we checked off and we had perfect attendance in Sunday school. Do you really know him? If you know him, are you committed to him? Do you have communion with him every day? And are you following through with fulfilling his great commission? Over and over, each one of these people had a confrontation. Somebody confronted them with the claims of Jesus Christ. There are people today that are criticizing confrontational evangelism. They say, oh, it doesn't work anymore. Yes, it does. It worked in this book. It still works. And so it's still in the book, and it does work. When you confront people with their, the, the claims of Christ, it convicts them of their sin, and their lives have the opportunity of being changed. To confront means to be face-to-face -face with somebody. If you're going to win anybody to Jesus, you ultimately have to bring them face-to-face -face with Jesus Christ. Some of the most beautiful words in the Bible is what's said about Andrew. He brought him to Jesus. Brought him to Jesus. You see, where there is a personal presentation, there's a positive declaration, and there's also a confrontation, and that leads to transformation. A transformed life. A powerful transformation took place, and that's the fourth thing I want you to notice about conversion by Jesus. When Peter and Nathaniel were confronted with Jesus, there was a tremendous transformation of life. Jesus gave Peter a new name. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas. I believe one of the reasons he gave Simon a new name was because Simon Peter became a new creature. He recognized who Jesus was. He not only gave him a new name, he gave Nathaniel a new nature. Nathaniel got a new nature. Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then he saw Jesus come. He said, yes, indeed, there could be. When you meet Jesus, you go from being a foe to being his friend. You go from being a doubter to being a disciple. When you, you go from being blind and not really knowing what your purpose is in life to really knowing, Rachel talks about this in her studies, what your real purpose of life is about. You go from darkness to light. You go from weakness to being mighty and strong in Him. And you go from knowing what is and doing wrong things to doing the right things. Let me just ask you today as we get ready to close the service, is there someone that you know that needs to know Jesus? Is there somebody that you know that you're desperately praying for that needs to know Jesus Christ? Because most of the time, the reality is nowadays, lost people aren't flocking into the doors of our church to be saved. There used to be a time when I was growing up, Pastor Doug, you probably remember this too, there'd be people praying in the altar for lost people. We don't see that anymore. Why not? Is it that we don't know lost people? Oh, we know them. But we do we know them by name? There used to be a time when there's lost people coming with people to church to give their commitment to Christ publicly. 
Why was that? Because somebody was out there sharing Christ. Didn't somebody share Christ with you? I just shared with you. My mother shared with me, my mother and dad, at my bedside at home one Sunday night. So somebody shared with you. Wouldn't it be very selfish of you and I if we didn't share with somebody else? Got real quiet here, didn't it? Because you see, the longer that we're in the huddle, the more comfortable it gets. So that's for you and no more. We're okay. And we forget that there are a lot of people out there. I even, when I watch the news at night, you might think this is strange. And I see where they've got these bodies lying there, covered up with a cloth. It comes to my mind, did that person know Jesus? Dwight L. Moody said, I consider every person with an L on their forehead until I know that they know Jesus. Are you that way? You have a sensitivity to that. You see, a lot of times we say, well, there are people around me that aren't like me. That's good. It means they need Jesus. There are people that are different than me. That's good. That means they need Jesus. Not long ago, I did the interim pastor at one of our churches, and I hooked up with a young man that came to the church. He was homeless. His name was West. Mom, you remember Gene? Y'all remember meeting West? Quite a character. Raised on the streets. But you know what? I got the opportunity to lead West to faith in Jesus Christ. My kids and my grandkids thought Wes was part of the family because he hung out with me all the time. And I still hear from Wes. He'll text me from time to time. And I still hear from him and what's going on in his life. Uh, Wes was not your model of person you wanted your kids to hang around and bring around your family. But I'm already around mine, but Wes had just six felonies in his background. And he was already in his 20s. But God came into his life and changed his life. There's some West in everybody's life. And you and I need to be sharing Christ with them. So what about you? Who will you bring to Jesus? I'm going to offer you a challenge as we close this morning. Billy Graham wrote this great track called Steps to Peace with God. This is kind of an abbreviated version, but on the last minute I got to thinking about it. I want to challenge you this is only one way to share Christ. Your testimony is another. But maybe you say, I don't know how to share Christ with anybody. This little brochure will take you step by step. You've never seen what's called a gospel tract. I gave you a bunch of these, a handful of them to your pastor. Because in a minute I said, Pastor, will you and the student pastor and, and, and the staff that's going to be up here leading the invitation get a handful of these and that's a commitment that we believe that there's nobody but Jesus, right? Amen? Well, a few of you do. We believe that there's nobody but Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, hey, that clock back there says, I got another hour. It still says 11 something. Okay? <laughs> so I'm trying to close. You better get with me here. All right. Nobody but Jesus. What I want to ask you to do during your invitation, if you would, as a commitment, Come to the front and take one of these. Just take one and give it to somebody this week. Or leave it for your one. Share it with your one. If you don't have a one, find a one. And put that in a prominent place and say, I need to share with somebody steps to peace with God. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you don't know Jesus, these pastors will be here to explain to you who Jesus is and how you can know it. But I hope that we'll run out of these this morning with somebody stepping forward and saying, Pastor, let me have one of those. I'm going to share that with somebody that I know this week. You see, Jesus does the same. And what we do is we sow the seed. Get the gospel out there. With our lips, with our feet, and the way that we live our lives. Let's pray together and ask God's blessing on this invitation time.